You know, the chain, there used to be a chain that went across the deep end. And he cut off a six foot length of chain. He folded up and said, you walk out with that chain. And you walk to the car and say, you may cut me, man, but I'm going to wrap this chain around your head. I said, you kidding me? He said, no, if you don't, don't come back. And he was right. Hello, everyone, friends, family, and fellows alike. Welcome to the first ever episode of American Madness. I'm your host, Connor Sharpless. I started this podcast because I'm something of a news junkie, an information addict, if you will. However, I found that shouting into the void of social media doesn't quite scratch the itch of our post-financial crash world. Why do I say that, do you ask? Have you noticed that our lives have been just a little bit more chaotic than they used to be? Each day, slightly more maddening than the previous. Well, fear not, you're not the only one who feels that way. If we tug on that thread and keep pulling, it will inevitably unwind all the way back to 2008 and the tumbling dominoes of the Wall Street misadventures. The underlying foundation of this podcast is that 12 years ago, we entered a new cultural, social, and political age, but that most of us were too shocked, too beaten down and exhausted to notice we'd entered new territory. This is what gave us the gig economy. This is what gave us a severe distrust in our governments. And this is what gave us a game show president. It's also what laid the groundwork for a perfect storm of global financial strife sparked by the coronavirus. It didn't have to be this way, but those in power are hell-bent on ignoring any lessons that could have been learned from the 2008 crisis. It's human nature to forget our past. Especially when it comes to politics, we have very short memories. In the last century alone, we have a wealth of knowledge to be gained from our mistakes. As the saying goes, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure as hell rhymes. This podcast is a mix of history, current events, just a pinch of opinion, and hopefully a bit of fun for you, the listener, and me, the rambler. Our seminal episode is going to be about former U.S. Senator, Vice President, and Lifeguard, Joseph Robinette Biden. As of this recording, he is the presumptive Democratic nominee in the 2020 presidential race. Although who knows, in a time this turbulent, anything could happen. We'll start with his 1988 bid for the presidency and work forward through all of his presidential campaigns, looking at the man that he used to be and who he is now. Thanks for listening. So first off, uh, I hope everyone's safe at home, and uh, I hope you're not going too crazy yet. I know that for me personally, podcasts is a good way to not only kill time, but also um, overcome some of the anxieties. I think the worst part of the pandemic is just not knowing when it's going to be over and how it'll be resolved. Uh, All we know is that things will be very different by the end of it. Who knows? Maybe by the end of it, we could have a President Joe Biden. That might be a thing. (laughs) So anyway... Today, we're going to start with his 1988 presidential campaign. In a lot of ways, this this had the most potential. I think Joe Biden still fancies himself as the man he was 30 years ago. In his mind, he's still this sort of rough-and-tumble, man's man, working-class hero kind of guy. So, starting out in 1987, the candidates for the 1988 Democratic nomination were starting to take shape. And they were plotting their best path forward out of the political wilderness that they'd been in for all of the 80s. And as beloved as Ronald Reagan was back then, any two-term president uh, is going to lead to a certain amount of public fatigue with the status quo. Millions of Americans had bought into Reagan's vision of a shining city on a hill. And a lot of them really did believe in trickle-down economics. It kind of made sense. But at the end of those eight years, they, they didn't see any sign of it. They thought, you know what? I'm still not doing that well. I voted for Reagan twice. And, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay, but I also see all these, you know, these millionaires and these corporations pulling in way more money than they used to. The wealthiest Americans and the corporations back then were experiencing some of their most profitable years since before the New Deal. You know, it was the, it was the beginning of the neoliberal era, which in many ways has become sort of a second gilded age in American history. 
So in the mix of all these Democratic hopefuls was Senator Joe Biden of Delaware, dreaming of being the youngest elected president since JFK. And Biden took office in the Senate in 1972 at the age of 30. Now, 30 years old is the minimum age requirement to become a senator. When he was elected, he was only 29, turning 30 years old about six weeks before he was inaugurated. So he was actually, I think to this day, he's still the sixth youngest senator in history, in U.S. history. So one thing that's kind of funny to me is whenever anyone talks about how Joe Biden is a progressive candidate, because, you know, for instance, the loathsome Jonathan Tate wrote this piece for New York Magazine entitled, Joe Biden's platform is more progressive than you think, and then proceeds to give zero evidence of how that's true. Even Bhaskar Sankara, founder of Jacobin, socialist magazine, he, uh, he wrote an op-ed for The Guardian called, Joe Biden used to be a progressive Democrat. What happened? Well, the answer to that is he was elected. Democrats have a long history, well, actually just politicians in general, have a history of running sort of populist campaigns, and then once they're elected, they completely ignore the average voters who got them elected and pander to the corporations or the wealthier individuals who gave them money and made their campaign possible. But especially amongst the Democratic Party, there's a tendency to, to run as sort of a, a progressive populist, and then if you win and you take office, you then govern very differently as sort of more of a corporatist. Perfect examples of this are our last two Democratic presidents, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Clinton is remembered as this pragmatic centrist ushering in a third way. Uh, but people forget that he ran a very populist campaign in the in 92. During that campaign, he was decrying the income inequalities created by the eight years under Reaganomics. And of course, you know, the beloved Barack Obama, for all the hope and change stuff that he talked about in both of his campaigns, in 08 and in 2012, none of that ever really materialized. And myself included, I sort of uh, had this image of Barack Obama during his presidency, sort of looking at him with rose-colored glasses. And since 2016, I've, I've had to reevaluate what I actually believe in and my own thoughts on the Democratic Party. And I've come to realize that he wasn't perfect. And of course he wasn't, but he wasn't really the progressive crusader he was billed to be in 2008. A lot of that had to do with consultants and his campaign managers. If you look at the way he governed as a senator and a state senator... He was much more of a centrist than um, than his 2008 campaign would have you believe. And this is just the curse of presidential campaigns in the modern era of political consulting. They create a persona for the public to believe in and, and to get their vote, but then they're forced to deal with the fallout when that candidate governs completely differently from the promises of their campaign platform. So it's really no wonder people have such little faith in politics. This is nothing new. This has been going on for decades. It's definitely gotten much worse with sort of the analytical, modern consulting of the last couple decades. But anyway, I digress. Back to Biden. What Bhaskar is talking about is he mentions Biden's progressive Senate campaign platform in 1972 when he first ran for Senate. And that campaign was fairly progressive. He talked about ending the war in Vietnam, protecting the environment, supporting civil rights, and he was attacking millionaires and corporations for not paying their fair share of taxes. And, and that was eight years before Reagan, when millionaires and corporations were paying more in taxes, especially compared to today. And as soon as he was elected, of course, he began to emphasize that he was a conservative in all these issues. In an interview in 1974 for the, the now-defunct Washingtonian, he told a reporter that he was pro-life, and he said about Roe versus Wade, I think it went too far. I don't think a woman has the sole right to say what happens to her body. And this is a quote that obviously looms ominously above him in the light of his allegations of sexual assault. Although, of course, that's only for people who are really paying attention. Most people are vaguely hearing about it, but not sure what to think, because the media refuses to touch it, because they're afraid of attacking Biden and possibly leading to the election of Trump. The irony in that is they don't realize that they are largely responsible for the 2016 victory of Trump by only talking about him for months. If you look, he opposed busing as a solution to segregation, which obviously came up in uh, the summer 2019 debates. 
when Kamala Harris famously said the whole I was that little girl thing. And he prided himself on his ability on his ability to work across the aisle with Republicans, namely segregationist Strom Thurmond, which really is nothing to be proud of. But in his mind, he was being a, a he was being an adult because he was he was willing to talk to the other side. But really, it just shows that he was willing to compromise his values and work with a blatant racist who was essentially a more polished version of David Duke. You know what's interesting about Strom Thurmond actually is that man stayed in Senate until he died at the age of, what, 100 or 101? Literally, there's there's footage of him in the Senate, and they're singing happy birthday to him for his 100th birthday. And the man doesn't even look like he knows where he is, <laughs> which, is uh, which is funny, because that's sort of what Joe Biden is becoming. But anyway, so after Jimmy Carter's crippling defeat in 1980 to, to Ronald Reagan in which both Biden's home and adopted states of Pennsylvania and Delaware voted for Reagan, Biden leaned into his conservative instincts and saw a rightward shift of the Democratic Party as the only way to win back the blue-collar Reagan Democrats, the ones that Biden felt he represented. So he was encouraged to run in 1984 because people thought he offered a new direction for the Democratic Party, but he ultimately declined and decided to wait four more years for an incumbent-free 1988 election to make his move. And one important character that sort of shared Biden's political beliefs was a man named Pat Cadle, who is a famous, a very famous um, campaign pollster and political strategist from the era. Who He actually worked for the Biden campaign in his inaugural 1972 run and helped him get elected. Cadle, similar to Biden, was obsessed with winning back the Solid South, which is um, the Southern Democrats that were lost to the Republican Party during the Kennedy and Johnson years. And if you add on to that, the new Reagan Democrats, which is the Democrats that they chose to switch sides in 1980 and 1984, they both saw this real erosion of working class Democrats drifting away from the Democratic Party and being wooed by the Republicans. So they fantasized about, you know, ways to make the party more, more relevant for those people. And if you look at Joe Biden, he's still trying to do this today. And he doesn't realize it's just far too late. He's really missed the vote on this. Especially when you look at the modern day Trump Democrats, who just represent a continuation of the erosion of the Democratic stronghold on working class America. It turns out that's what happens after a half century of just paying lip service to the working class and then selling them out every chance you get. I'd say at this point, Rust Belt Trump Democrats who voted for him in 2016, are now permanently new Republicans. I don't think they're ever coming back. I think in 2016, Bernie Sanders had a chance to win those people over, but even if he had got the nomination this time around, I don't think he could have... I think it was too late. I think those people were solidly Trump fans and weren't really willing to give Bernie a chance. But in 1987, uh, leading up to the 1988 election... Biden thought he had the right message to win these people back. And his inclination to work with conservative Southern Democrats and Republicans and his gaff-prone, impromptu speaking style kind of made him come off as an authentic voice, or at least he seemed like an authentic voice, for, for the, a champion for the little guy. And quite honestly, as I said before, 1988 was probably Joe Biden's best shot at the White House. It sounds funny... Because his campaign was derailed by his famous plagiarism speech, and he never even made it to Iowa, but I really see that year as a squandered opportunity for him and his campaign. Something It was sort of a moment that he, he's never been able to recapture. He did have strong support, even after the allegations of plagiarism, which were real. Other prominent uh, members of Congress came out and publicly said, I've taken lines from other speeches, and I've done the same thing as Joe Biden. And this, this just happens sometimes, and I don't think Joe Biden meant to do it, and that probably is true. And for those who don't really know what I'm talking about, he had a speech that he gave in 1987 that was almost word for word the same as a Welsh Labour MP named Neil Kinnock. So I have here the audio of the two speeches. This is from a NBC report from September of 1987. And I started thinking as I was coming over here. Why is it that Joe Biden is the first in his family ever to go to a university? Why is it that my wife is sitting out there in the audience 
is the first in her family to ever go to college. People in Britain would have been familiar with those words. They heard the same ones in a political commercial from Labour Party leader Neil Kinnock. Why am I the first Kinnock in a thousand generations to be able to get the university? Why is Glenys the first woman in her family in a thousand generations? Biden saw the Kinnock commercial and evidently loved it. Was it because they were weak? Those people who could wait, work eight hours underground and then come up and play football. Weak. My ancestors who worked in the coal mines in northeast Pennsylvania and who come up after 12 hours and play football for four hours. Biden had told other audiences he admired Kinnock, not this one. This one, he later said, he had listening in hushed silence. No, it's not because they weren't as smart. It's not because they didn't work as hard. It's because they didn't have a platform upon which to stand. Anybody really think that they didn't get what we had because they didn't have the talent or the strength or the endurance or the commitment? Of course not. It was because there was no platform upon which they could stand. So there you go. You know, it was a very small part of the speech. Most people wouldn't have ever known if it wasn't leaked to the press. So they're very close, and Biden had intended on referencing Kinnick's name. But for whatever reason, it slipped his mind, and that ended up being his downfall. Because as it turns out, around that time, in August into September of 1987, it was a very slow news cycle as far as the Democratic primary campaigns were concerned. There wasn't a whole lot else happening, so the media decided to cling on to this story for the entire month. And what it exposed is a prior pattern in Joe Biden's history of plagiarizing other material. They dug up a story about him plagiarizing a paper that he wrote in law school. And after all this pressure, Joe Biden decided that it wasn't the right time, and he he ultimately pulled out, ending his campaign in September of 1987, four months before any voting took place at all. In hindsight, I think his campaign could have weathered the storm and came out stronger stronger on the other side. For all his flaws, and there are many, I think Joe Biden would have been a far superior candidate to Dukakis in 1987. It was actually, it turned out, one of Michael Dukakis's campaign staff that leaked the news of Joe Biden's plagiarism to the press, leaking a a copy of the original uh, Neil Kinnock speech. So Michael Dukakis then made a show of firing that guy. Um, I can't remember his name at the moment, but he fired him. And then months later, when people had sort of forgotten about the whole thing, he rehired that member of his staff. No, I think that Biden should have realized that the primaries were an eternity ahead of September and that people had really short memories for things like this. I think he should have just sort of ignored it. He should have just made a pitch to the working class that this was sort of a elitist smear job against him. Because honestly, the type of people he was trying to reach out to are the people who could care less about him plagiarizing speeches. All he had to do was point a finger at the elitists, you know, the the ever-present and nebulous enemy of the working class. All he had to do was wait it out, and I swear, by by Halloween of that year, the media would have moved on to something else. That story is not interesting enough to really last. What he should have done is left the question up to the voters. He should have let them decide in Iowa and New Hampshire. Instead, I think he thought that he was so young that he had opportunities to run again in the future, and that maybe right now wasn't his chance. But my gut tells me that if he had continued to stick to his sort of anti-Reagan populist rhetoric, he would have had at least a very strong showing in the primary elections and possibly clinched the nomination, and then maybe won the presidency after that. Really... The only reason that George H.W. Bush won in 1988 is because the Democrats managed to nominate someone even more boring and elitist and out of touch with the public than Vice President Bush. But what, what the plagiarized speech did reveal about Biden is that he ultimately relied more on sort of a, a political toughness than any kind of creativity. And his campaign in many ways was an imitation of JFK, who he has said before is his favorite president. But I don't think that imitation would have worked necessarily. Had Joe Biden become the 1988 nominee instead of Dukakis, he would have had a lot of things in common with JFK. 
uh, Biden and Kennedy both would have been young Democratic senators running against the vice president of a popular two-term Republican president. Both men were Catholics from the Northeast. They were both good orators. And I know it may sound funny when I say that he, that Joe Biden is a good orator or was a good orator, because now today we know him as this sort of gaff prone, stumbling, possibly senile old man. But there was a time where he actually was a very good speaker. There wasn't always much substance to what he had to say, but he, he was adept at speaking his way around problems. If you listen to this footage from when he first announced in April of 1987, he actually sounds pretty good. He sounds way better than he does today. He could think on his feet. He could talk on his feet. And you also sort of see what I'm talking about with his uh, his imitation of JFK. There's sort of a, a similar cadence that's sort of borrowed from JFK speeches. It kind of reminds me of Pete Buttigieg when he would come out on stage after Iowa or places like that. He would sort of lower the tone of his voice and try to speak like Obama. That is essentially what Joe Biden was doing with JFK back in the 80s. And here's a clip of that now. After conceding just last weekend that no one knows me, Senator Joseph Biden of Delaware today became the fifth Democrat to declare he's seeking the party's presidential nomination. Lim Tucker has our report. In 1988, the clarion call for my generation is not, it is our turn, but rather, it is our moment of obligation and opportunity. He is Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. from Delaware, 44 years old, 14 years in the U.S. Senate Chairman Judiciary Committee, a Democrat who calls himself a pragmatic liberal. He has a reputation as maybe the best order in the Senate, but a long-winded one. And he is criticized by some in his party for being a senator and candidate of themes, not substance. Biden rejects that criticism, but today, oratory and themes were very much on display. And for a decade led by Ronald Reagan, self-aggrandizement has become the full-throated cry of this society. I've got mine, so why don't you go get yours? His weak points are um, a lack of a legislative record, a... Um, somewhat skeptical acceptance as to whether uh, he has ideas as big as his words or his mouth. Biden comes in behind most other Democrats in the early polls, but has assembled a well-respected staff, and more importantly, has raised far more money than any of his competitors. Lem Tucker, CBS News, Wilmington. And you can see what I'm talking about. He, he sounds way better back then than he does today. But anyway, I digress. Uh, Biden and Kennedy, they were both adept at energizing crowds. Biden had the added advantage of being from a working class family, unlike John Kennedy. So he was immune from any kind of charges of elitism against him. Biden would have made H.W. Bush look like a sweaty Richard Nixon on live TV. Bush's greatest flaw was always his perceived inauthenticity and his inability to connect with the common man. Why do you think he started eating pork rinds and listening to country music? Because his campaign was trying desperately to make him seem like he was anything but the New England elitist that he was. As where, on the other side, Biden oozed authenticity. Biden was a common man. It's also interesting to think about who he would have chose as the vice president. And I think much as the kind of elder stately Lyndon B. Johnson was added to the Kennedy ticket to balance out his youth and inexperience, Biden or more likely Pat Cadell, for Biden, would have picked an older statesman, probably from the South. My guess, I'm thinking that he would have picked Senator Dale Bumper of Arkansas, a name that probably isn't remembered these days, but he ran in 1988, he was in the mix, uh, he was sort of a populist favorite of people like Pat Cadell, and Bumper would have solidified their strategy of winning back these lost Democrats. A Biden-Bumper ticket would have signified to the more conservative elements of the Democratic Party, a rejection of creeping liberalism and left-wing ideas of the 1960s and 70s. And in many ways, that's what Joe Biden's still trying to do. He still has this idea that the reason Trump got elected is because the Democratic Party 
has gotten too out of touch with working class issues. And it's it's funny because he's right, but he doesn't realize that he himself is one of those out of touch elements of the government. In many ways, if he had secured the nomination, Joe Biden in 1988 could have been Bill Clinton four years before Bill Clinton was Bill Clinton. But sadly, he stepped aside and possibly against his own better judgment, decided that he would just wait for a better time in the future. And what he didn't realize was the timing was never going to be more perfect for a Joe Biden presidency. So the election of Bill Clinton in 1992 sort of validated Joe Biden's type of politics, but he was no longer a well-known name outside of Washington. People kind of forgot who he was. There was a bit of excitement around him back in 1988 and 1987, but then he became more of a, a quiet, behind-the-scenes operator for that decade. He still had hopes of one day becoming president, but he knew from his years in Washington and operating within the Democratic Party, he knew, he knew the way things worked. So when 2000 came around, he didn't run because he knew the party was going to back Al Gore. Al Gore was going to be their man. So there was really no point pissing off people inside of the party by primarying Al Gore. And then when 2004 came around, supposedly Biden was tempted to run, but I think he realized that he had been fairly supportive of George Bush in his first term. He had voted for the Iraq war, and he just generally sided with a lot of conservatives. So he was at least savvy enough to realize that he would have a very hard time making his case against George Bush. He's also always been keenly aware of the fact that it's much harder to run against an incumbent. So he's always preferred to run in election cycles free of incumbents. So Q2007, in the final years of the George Bush administration, Biden starts gearing up to once again run an election in the wake of a divisive two-term Republican president. And apparently that year he was actually worried that he would have to talk his family into it. And then supposedly, they held a family meeting, and to his surprise, they had all come to the conclusion on their own that, that he should run, and that he had a good chance of winning. And at that point, he hadn't even told them of his intentions to run, although I'm sure they knew. Apparently, he's been talking about his desire to be president since he was a teenager. So just like in 1988, he knew that running in an incumbent free election leveled the playing field. But the problem was, right off the bat, he instantly lacked the traction that young Joe Biden had 20 years earlier. Young voters didn't know who the hell he was, and a lot of, a lot of older voters had probably forgotten who he was. And on top of that, there was a real push by the Democratic Party for either Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton, because they represented a, more, a younger and more diverse type of party and the direction that they wanted to move in. So Joe was running on his record as a six-term senator, offering a mature, steady hand at the helm. But meanwhile, the masses of the Democratic Party wanted fresh faces and new blood. So his 2008 campaign really was doomed from the start. His persona that he's cultivated works best as a younger, a younger more vigorous man. But in 2008, he kind of seemed cantankerous and old and of a bygone era. He especially seems that way today. But even, even 12 years ago, he was already an old man then. And now he's an even older man. And as before, his tendency to go off script and ramble was a detriment to his campaign. He was running the same playbook from the 1988 election in a world that completely changed around him. And as always, his campaign it was more style than substance. In many ways, he's, kind of a he's sort of a political chameleon. You never quite know where Joe Biden stands on any issue. But it was clear from hypothetical matchups that were done against Republican candidates that Biden was going to lose every time. In a matchup against McCain, he was going to lose 38 to 45 percent. Against Giuliani, he was going to lose 37 to 46 percent. Against Fred Thompson, he was going to lose 38 to 40 percent. So no, no matter where you put it, it seemed likely that he, he was going to lose. And similar to 1988, Biden was framing the fight against the Republicans as an attack against the eight-year failures of the Republican incumbent. In 88, it was this idea that it was this idea of the failure of the trickle-down economics. And in 2008, it was the tragic debacle of the Iraq War. And even though he voted for the war initially, he knew that 
he could weasel his way around that. So he decided early in the campaign, back in 2006, that he's going to center his whole campaign around a plan to end U.S. involvement in Iraq. And his idea at the time was to federalize Iraq, as he put it, creating three separate autonomous regions for the Sunnis, the Shiites, and the Kurds. And this would, quote, give breathing room to the three separate groups. Now, at face value, this might actually sound like, a, like it's a good idea. But first off, it wasn't actually Joe Biden's idea. It was what came to be known as the Biden-Brownback resolution for Senators Joe Biden and Senator Brownback. And it was largely authored by Leslie Gelb, a longtime senior official of both the Defense and State Department. But Biden would sort of claim this idea as his own, similar to the charges against him in 1988 of plagiarism. And it's all indicative, it's really indicative of Joe Biden's career as a whole. He's never exactly been the most creative senator or the most creative politician. He's, he's always had very few original thoughts on policy. He largely steals or borrows ideas from others around him and attaches his name to those projects. Here's a clip of him in the 2008 debate. I think it was the one just before Iowa. And he's, he's talking about Iraq. And he mentions his plan for, for a federated division of Iraq. Here's the bottom line. The same thing was said when we were pushing the settlement that we had called the Dayton Accords in, in uh, uh, Bosnia. What happened? Once there's an overall agreement, and my, my, my uh, Kurdish friend knows I don't have to kill him before he kills me, a Sunni, because there's been an overall agreement, what's happened? There haven't been that kind of thing happening in those same cities, Sarajevo, Tuzla, uh, all those places that were mixed populations. Once there's an all agreement, it stops. The last point I'll make. Look, folks, it's real simple. The simple proposition here is you're not going to be able to govern this country from the center, period. There's already four and a half million people that have fled their regions. And the only way you're going to do it is give people local control over their local regions, their local security within a loosely federated republic. Or we're never going to get out of there without leaving chaos behind. And like with the clips I played earlier, uh, you can see that 12 years ago he was he was a pretty good speaker. You know, this, what, the substance of what he's saying is always, there's, there's always a lot of fluff involved with it. He's very long-winded, but he can actually get the words out, which, you know, he can't always, he doesn't always seem to be able to do these days. So he pointed to his decades in the Senate, touting his experience, but he failed to name any real accomplishments during that time. This might have been because of his conservative instincts that led him to time and again vote in favor of Republican legislation. One prime example is his involvement in the passage of the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act, which is a mouthful. So an earlier version of the bill was essentially vetoed by Bill Clinton in the final days of his presidency by letting the bill go unsigned after the lame duck congressional session adjourned. And George Bush and the Republicans wanted to pass this bill, but they were initially sidelined by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and other high-priority bills for them. But after Bush's re-election and Republican consolidation of seats in the House and the Senate, they saw their chance to push the bill through. And Joe Biden was one of the only Democrats to support the bill, probably because he's always been this idiosyncratic conservative Democrat who fetishizes bipartisan cooperation, often at the expense of conceding power to the Republicans. It was also because as a, a senator from Delaware, he had been, always been cozy with various financial institutions who use that state as their headquarters to avoid paying their fair share in taxes. And this bill made it much harder for individuals to file for bankruptcy, and in particular made it impossible to declare bankruptcy on student loans. So it's largely responsible for the current student loan crisis, which I think stands at one, roughly $1 trillion of outstanding student loans. What's funny to me is this This is actually the bill that brought Elizabeth Warren into stardom because of C-SPAN footage of her clashing with Joe Biden in a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing. And let me tell you, those hearings are actually are very hard to listen to because it's mostly Joe Biden droning on and talking over Elizabeth Warren. He has this annoying way of asking a question and taking about eight minutes to do it. 
And when he's finally done, you're not, you don't really remember what the question was. But it did a very good job of making Warren <clears throat> look like a friend of, of the working class and make Biden look like the villain. And she, warn, she was warning about the... She was warning about the disproportionate dangers for the middle class and the working class and the disproportionate advantages to credit card companies and to lenders that, that came from this bill. And just three years later, the passage of that bill left millions of Americans dangerously exposed to the worst effects of the 2008 crisis. If Biden had somehow won the 2008 nomination, he was going to have to answer for that, regardless of the fact that that the bill was passed in a Republican-controlled Congress. Few others, especially a few other Democrats, tied themselves so closely to that bill. And it really just wasn't going to be a good look for him. He realized that the bigger fight was the primary, that any Democrat was going to have a pretty good chance after eight years of Bush. But he knew that the primary was going to prove to be a much tougher fight. And he was banking on his perceived experience and maturity. Uh, but it, it really quickly it became apparent after his disastrous finish and fifth place, that he was not up to the task. And probably, like I said, because of his years in Congress and his years inside the Democratic Party, Joe Biden understands the way that the, that the party works. So he realized that if, if he dropped out as soon as possible, he, it would give him more leverage once the nominee was chosen. <clears throat> he, knew, he knew that the best path forward was to wait and see who, who was probably going to be the nominee, and then become one of the first people to back that nominee. Now, Biden apparently has a very close personal relationship with Hillary Clinton, but he realized at a certain point that it was going to be Barack Obama, and he jumped on the bandwagon. And it, and it ended up working. Uh, he was able to leverage that and become the vice presidential pick, much for the same reason, again, that Lyndon B. Johnson was picked as JFK's running mate. Biden was seen as sort of a mature, steady-handed statesman who had been around a long time. He was there to balance the unseasoned Senator Barack Obama. And apparently, actually, they floated the idea of Hillary Clinton as, as, the, as the VP pick, but they didn't want to rock the boat too much because it was, already, it was already quite controversial to have, you know, the first black presidential candidate. And many members of the party felt that adding a female vice president would be an unnecessary amount of drama to add to the campaign. It was also ideologically inconsistent because Obama had spent all of the primaries viciously attacking uh, Hillary Clinton. It's funny, in the 2020 Democratic primary, it was very soft. Pretty much everyone was afraid to pull any punches against someone else because they all had this idea that whoever the eventual nominee was, uh, you'd only be hurting them, hurting their chances against Trump and giving them ammunition for him to use in the general election, which is absurd because Trump and his campaign team would have found that information anyway. So by having sort of a vigorous primary, you're really able to, to weed out the weaker candidates. And if there are major issues, bring them to light and find a way to deal with them before the general election. But instead, we ended up having a very soft field where no one really attacked anyone the attacks were far softer than the ones in the past, especially in 2008. If you go back and look at some of the some of the primary campaign videos from the Barack Obama campaign, they were vi they were viciously attacking Hillary Clinton, really calling her out for not being trustworthy. So, at the end of that bitter primary fight, it really made no sense for the two of them to be on the ticket together. So Biden came along and he was able to successfully leverage his political capital, all by dropping out early. And supposedly behind the scenes, um, Barack Obama was actually very unhappy with the gaffe-prone Joe Biden. I know that they're seen, you think of them now as like best buds, and the sort of public image of the two is this uh, eight-year friendship that they had in the White House together. But apparently early on, they really didn't like each other, or at least Obama didn't really care for, for Biden. But, uh, but looking back at it, Biden's sort of folksy, stuttering candor was a perfect way to balance Obama's, you know, eloquent language, uh, which might have made him a very good speaker, but also allowed for sort of these elitist charges against him. So a little inside information on how the Democratic Party makes their decisions. 
about candidates, especially when it comes to presidential candidates and, and the VP pick. So back in 2008, once Barack Obama became the Democratic nominee, as I said before, uh, they knew that they needed to pick someone older, someone more seasoned to balance out his youth. And when they picked Joe Biden, there was an implicit understanding between Biden and the party that he would never become president. He was seen as too old, even at that point he was seen as too old, but especially they, they factored in eight years of Obama. By 2016, they figured Joe Biden would be far too old at that point to ever run. And I bet even as early as 2008, 2012, a lot of the party leadership kind of realized they were going to put Hillary at the top of the ticket. So Joe Biden knew this at the end of Barack Obama's term. A lot of the reason why he didn't run is because he knew he would face a lot of opposition from within his own party. He knew that the winds were blowing towards Hillary. They, they had the first black president, and now the Democrats wanted to have the first female president. Even though he was the vice president for eight years under Barack Obama, it was going to be a tough sell back then, just as it is now, to make this old white man a president in a party that claims to love diversity. And something I recently found out is, um, well, some of you may know that Bernie Sanders reached out to Elizabeth Warren in 2015 and tried to get her to run against Hillary, to primary her. Ultimately, Warren decided not to run. At that point, Bernie Sanders decided to step in and run himself. What I didn't realize until recently is that Joe Biden also reached out to Elizabeth Warren because when he was considering running in 2016, his plan was he was going to make Elizabeth Warren his running mate. So it would have been a potential Biden-Warren ticket in 2016. Partly he knew that he needed some sort of diversity in his administration and on the ticket. So having a female vice president would have fit the bill. But also, even Joe Biden, you know, wherever he may stand on the issues, he realized that a winning strategy was going to be running just to the left of Hillary Clinton. And he knew that having a progressive figure like Senator Warren at his side was his best chance of doing that. But ultimately, he never really gained any traction, and he never decided to run, because he realized how much the, how, what the party was willing to do to make Hillary there, to coronate Hillary in 2016. So he probably figured it was best, again, just not to run at all, and that he would have better leverage at a later date, maybe. 2016 for him was probably very similar to 2000, where he, he maybe he wanted to run really badly, but he knew that the party was going to pick someone else. In 2000, it was Al Gore. And in 2016, it was Hillary Clinton. And it's, it's odd for him running in 2020 because it, it really goes against... It's very different from his prior two campaigns. Obviously, both times around, he was running in the wake of two-term Republican president, this is his first time running against an incumbent president. And likely it's because he's running against Trump. And everyone out there seems to think that Trump is so uniquely terrible, a unique stain on history, of American history, that they think anyone has a good chance of running against him. That if, if he could win in 2016, all preconceived notions about polling and politics have really gone out the window. And in some ways, that's right. I've been very skeptical about Joe Biden that he could win. But in the light of coronavirus, I really think that he actually has a real shot of winning. I think it's entirely out of his hands. In my view, in my view, the 2020 election is going to come down to a referendum on how Donald Trump handles coronavirus. So far, he's been doing a fairly lackluster job. If he continues to do that, even his base is going to be upset with him. And at that point, he does not. He will not have the numbers to come out and win him re-election in November. I think even, even without all the left-wing Bernie-crats that maybe won't vote for the Democrats, even without them, I still think there's a chance that Joe Biden could beat Trump if Trump continues to do a botched job of handling the, the pandemic and then in the wake of that handling... handling 
trying to fix our economy and put it back on its rails. We're really seeing something akin to George Bush and the Republican debacle in 2008 during the re- the crash. You know, they were they were all deficit hawks for decades at that point, and as soon as the economy tanked, suddenly they're all pumping money into the economy, which completely goes against the conservative ideas of letting the market work its will. You know, if they, if they were true capitalists, they would have just let these businesses go under. They would have let them crash. But the Republicans, just like the, Demo- just like the Democrats, have really become two corporatist parties. And there was, an always, and there was always an understanding there from Wall Street and, and the biggest corporations that if anything happened, whoever was in power wasn't going to let them suffer. They, they made these risky moves knowing that if something happened, they had the insurance of government bailout. It was never a question to them. And the same thing is happening again 12 years later. As the economy is shutting down in the midst of this pandemic, what are we getting? We're getting table scraps. We're getting $1,200 checks that can't even pay for everyone's rent. And aren't even. some people aren't even going to get those checks for months. And what good is that? Meanwhile, large multinational companies are getting massive billion-dollar bailouts. I know the cruise lines have been getting bailouts. They're all getting bailed out. Meanwhile, I'm sure that they're not paying any of their staff because they're probably all on contracted gig work, most of them. And and these companies, their headquarters are all in the Cayman Islands and offshore accounts. So t- they're not even technically American companies, and yet they want American taxpayer money to bail them out. And they're getting it, and they knew they were going to get it. There was never any question of it. And people on the left and the right are both seeing that they're getting screwed again. And you can't screw over twice in 12 years. You can't have people lose their houses, lose their jobs, their, their livelihood twice in 12 years without some, some major political implications. And I think, and the anger isn't even a left-right thing. It's, it's, it's a class, it's a vertical thing. It's classist. You know, the 1%, the millionaires and billionaires and the large corporations, they're doing perfectly fine. In fact, many of them are doing even better than they were doing before this pandemic. And lots of, you know, millions of Americans who were already struggling, they were already trying to keep their heads above water. A lot of them aren't going to make it through this. They aren't making it now and they're not going to make it through this pandemic because there's been a, such a lack of leadership on either side. Whether it's, it's willful ignorance, purposefully done, or it's just chalked up to bad leadership, I can't entirely say. I'm sure it's a mix of both. But people all across the political spectrum are furious. And that includes a lot of Trump supporters. And sure, some of them are going to vote for him no matter what. But I'm sure there's others there who are, are realizing now that that he's not fulfilling his promises. You know, his, his main thing was he was going to take care of the economy. And that the economy was doing so well under him. And look at it now. What is there, 30 million people unemployed? I'm sure the numbers are higher than that because not everyone has been able to get on to unemployment yet. And that's the thing about the economy collapsing is it's, it's indiscriminate. You know, the, the pandemic, the coronavirus doesn't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. It doesn't care who you're going to vote for. Your boss and your boss doesn't care who you're going to vote for. Your employer. Some people are lucky enough that they're, they're still getting paid. Some people are, being, are able to work from home, but many others, depending on their line of work, aren't getting anything, and they're not even ge- guaranteed a job when they get back. I'm sure there's, there's probably countless you know, stores across the country that are not going to reopen physical stores, and it's only going to be online sales, at which point hundreds of thousands or millions of Americans who, who did work in places like Target or Walmart or those kind of big box stores, a lot of them aren't going to reopen and they're suddenly without a job. They have no money coming in, but the money is still pouring out because they still have to pay for their rents, their mortgages, they have to pay for their kids, or they have to pay for their student loans. And it would be so easy to fix it, even if it was for selfish reasons, even if it was just for the the political political gains. Someone like Trump could just put, they could just put a moratorium on rent and mortgage. Even if he wasn't doing it out of the goodness of his heart, he could be doing it to ensure his re-election. 
And it would work. It would definitely work. People would love him. People who maybe didn't like him before would say, you know, at least I didn't lose my house because of Donald Trump. But um, he's not doing any of that. He, he's kind of doing such a mixed job. He's trying to play it both ways. But that's just a dangerous strategy. And maybe he'll get reelected, but maybe he won't. I, I think it's no one knows at this point what's going to happen. 2020 is an even bigger question mark than 2016 was. And so Joe Biden, Sleepy Joe, he's been running such a strange, seemingly doomed campaign from the start with such little energy. And it could work because people are so fed up that they would just vote for anyone, even Joe Biden, against Donald Trump. Just any generic person, anyone at all. Sure, I'm sure that I'm sure they would prefer if it wasn't an old, senile white man, who may or may not have sexually assaulted a woman in, in the '90s, but they don't really care. You know, some of them are making excuses for him, but others are just outwardly saying, "Yeah, I see that Joe Biden's a bad guy, but I don't care because he's not as bad as Trump." So suddenly, Biden finds himself in a situation that he, he definitely could not have predicted. A man that was never supposed to be president, that was always just supposed to be Barack Obama's goofy sidekick, suddenly late in life finds himself just inches away from presidency. quick break from our show to insert what would be an advertisement if this show had any sponsors, but it doesn't. All the work is done courtesy of my own personal love and enthusiasm for the subject. And there's a lot more that goes into editing a podcast than I originally thought. You never notice how many weird sounds your mouth makes until you have to play back your own voice 800 times. This will hopefully continue to be a free weekly podcast for your listening pleasure, although I might eventually add in some paid bonus content. We'll see about that. If you'd like to reach out for questions or comments, or would like to suggest a topic for the show, you can reach me on Twitter at AmericanMadAF, or on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash American Madness. I know this first podcast is a little rough, but I'm building towards something here. If you're enjoying me rant and ramble, I encourage you to stick with me. If you'd be so kind... Could you subscribe or comment on the podcast wherever you listen? It'll help us find new listeners. Better yet, word of mouth. Tell a friend. Anyway, I won't take any more of your time. Now, back to the show. So... If we look at the the roots of Biden's 2020 election, they obviously go back to 2016. And I think for the first two years following the 2016 election, there was this real, there was this sort of will he, won't he narrative surrounding Biden and a potential 2020 run. And I remember seeing hypothetical matchups at the time, uh, similar similar to sort of Bernie versus Trump. It was Joe Biden versus Trump in 2016. And they showed that Biden would have narrowly defeated Trump. Um, now, obviously, this is speculation. There was just sort of a small amount of polling to back it up. And what good did polling really do us in 2016? So we have no way of knowing what the outcome would have been in that matchup. But I think it highlights the frustration of millions of Hillary Clinton voters uh, who simply felt that they were forced between picking the lesser of two evils. And they were really tired of having to do that. That's why thousands of voters in, in key uh, Rust Belt states simply left the top of the ticket blank. And, and very briefly for a time, in, tw- in about 2017, I remember there was an honest discussion, or at least an attempt of an honest discussion, of why Trump won. And, and maybe, maybe a different candidate could have won if it wasn't Hillary. And in the end, it all sort of amounted to shoulda, coulda, woulda-ism, and Ultimately, much of the media just decided that Trump Trump won because half the country are craven secret racists. And, and now that Trump is in charge, the cat is out of the bag. 
and surprise, your neighbors are all racists. As we're really, I think there's millions of people who voted for Trump for many different reasons. Many of them maybe abhorred him as a personal figure, but liked some of the ideas that he was talking about, and they were willing to stomach him, much in the same way that maybe today, a lot of people can't stomach Joe Biden personally, but they're going to vote for him because look at the alternative. And then there's people who voted for Trump just because his name was on the ticket and they were Republican and they were never going to vote for Hillary. They probably thought that Trump was going to lose. They probably didn't like him, but they just voted straight ticket. And then they were forced to feel guilty for it later on, even though the media narrative for months was that he could never win and that Hillary Clinton was going to have a landslide victory. So if they had known there was a real chance, perhaps... Perhaps they would have left it blank, like others, or voted for third party, or maybe even voted for Hillary Clinton. After all, even Republican leadership didn't want Trump to win, because they realized being the opposition under Hillary Clinton would be far easier than actually being in power with Donald Trump at the helm. I know Paul Ryan definitely would have been happier, and he would still be, he would probably still be Speaker of the House. I know Mitch McConnell would be happier if he didn't have to horse whisper into the ear of Trump every few weeks. And Fox News would have loved it. Because it would be so much easier to just attack everything that Hillary Clinton did for four or eight years instead of having to create weird narratives and apologies for President Donald Trump. So anyway, then when Biden did announce his candidacy... There wasn't a whole lot of excitement around it. I think there was much, especially early on, there was much more excitement around Elizabeth Warren or Beto O'Rourke or Kamala Harris. You know, younger candidates and female candidates. Ultimately, the, the first and second place candidates, Joe Biden and Bernie, and Bernie Sanders, were really not given much attention in, in the early days of the primaries. They both seemed to be washed up has-beens. Even a lot of Bernie Sanders sympathetic people, they, they now had other options. They had, a lot of them went to, to Elizabeth Warren. Some of them went to people like Pete Buttigieg or Beto O'Rourke. You know, the people who were looking for, or Cory, or Cory Booker. These are the people who were looking for sort of a, a second Barack Obama, a, a new and younger Barack Obama. The entire time, Biden was always the, technically the front runner just because of his, his status as former vice president. But most people didn't really believe that. There wasn't much enthusiasm for his candidacy. He kind of just crept along in the background the entire time. He was there, but most people didn't expect him to go the distance, especially with his poor performance in the debates. I think what helped him is that there were so many people on the stage that he didn't have to stand out. He, he could just sit quietly in the background, speaking every now and then, try to get his point across. But because there were so many other people, and there was so much happening, the spotlight really wasn't on him. Occasionally, it, it would be. I remember there was briefly a... Cory Booker attacked him for forgetting that he had just said the same thing a few minutes before. Uh, obviously, Kamala Harris attacked him for his his vote on busing and uh, de desegregation. But for the most part, especially with Bernie Sanders, people really weren't willing or able to attack Joe Biden and, and to attack his record. You know, with Bernie, it was always my friend Joe Biden. He always said that. Maybe if he had been willing to set aside his personal relationship with Joe Biden to have an honest and objective accounting of Joe Biden's record for the last several decades. Maybe he could have convinced more people Biden wasn't the right choice. But instead, Bernie and others weren't willing to, to attack Joe Biden. And in the end, really what did it, really what was his saving grace, was his performance in South Carolina. He, he was seen as all but dead at that point. He had done so poorly in the first three primaries in Iowa and New Hampshire and Nevada. And it was, he was still expected to win South Carolina, but it was, it could have been very close. 
And I think if, if Bernie had done better, if it had been a, a close race in South Carolina, perhaps Biden wouldn't be where he is today. But instead, Bernie, the Bernie Sanders campaign failed to get the endorsement of Jim Clyburn of South Carolina, or at the very least convinced Jim Clyburn not to endorse Joe Biden, which in my opinion is a bit of political malfeasance. Bernie just said that that Jim Clyburn has very different politics than his own, and that he was never going to support Bernie. And that may have been the case, but he could have at least tried to get Jim not to support Joe Biden. Because as it, as it turns out from exit polling, a lot of the people who voted for Joe Biden in South Carolina voted for him because of Jim Clyburn's endorsement. The electoral makeup of, of the Democratic primary in South Carolina is, uh, is much more African-American than most of the country, and it's much older. And this is a, a good audience for Joe Biden, and he was really banking on it the whole time. And it turns out that it, it worked in the end. Even much earlier, even back in, back in 2019, between April and May, he spent about 80% of all of his funds, of all his advertising funds, which ended up being about $900,000, on Facebook ads targeted towards people who are 45 years and older. Because very early on, the Biden strategy was to target the people that they know always come out during primary elections. The Bernie Sanders strategy was always based on bringing new people into the system. It was always very hopeful. And had that worked, he, he would have won. But instead, the Biden team said, we're going to focus on the people that we know are going to turn out, and that's older Democratic voters. And it worked. So then what we see post-South Carolina, in, in the few days before Super Tuesday, is that all of these other sort of centrist candidates suddenly drop out. Amy Klobuchar, Pete Buttigieg, and people start rallying behind Biden. And there's this green light from the Democratic Party and from Democratic-friendly media outlets like CNN, MSNBC, all start rallying behind Joe Biden. Because that was the problem all along. That's what helped Bernie, was that it was a divided field. It was similar in 2016 with the Republican primaries. Trump largely won because it was a, divide, a divided field. For if from the beginning it had just been Trump versus Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz probably would have won. But... Because the Trump alternative was never clear, and there was such a, a mixed bag of these different candidates, Trump was able to get that 30 to 40 percent of the vote, that plurality that allowed him to, to beat the crowded field. And the same thing, and that's exactly what Bernie was banking on early on in the 2020 primary. And it worked when there was, when there was Biden and Klobuchar and Buttigieg and Warren. But suddenly, just before Super Tuesday, all these people dropped out and they got behind Biden. And they suddenly realized, this is our man, this is the one we're going to rally behind. And, and there wasn't much reporting on this, but what happened behind the scenes, supposedly, is Barack Obama reached out to Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar and convinced them to drop out. I suspect that they were promised positions in, in the Biden administration if he, if he wins. And if he loses, they, they're probably, they were probably guaranteed funding for future races or some sort of position within the DNC leadership. So they were being very opportunistic. And on the other hand, on the, um, the left-wing progressive side of the Democratic Party, Elizabeth Warren did not drop out, even though she had a poor performance in the first four states. And in doing so, it then split that side of the party. So instead of, instead of a matchup of just Bernie versus Biden, it was Bernie and Warren versus Biden. So there's a good chance that he would, it would have been at least much closer if Warren had also decide to, decided to drop out and, and back Bernie. And I know a lot of Warren supporters really hate that idea and hate that narrative that she, she, was, she should have dropped out. I'm not saying that personally. I'm just, but I am saying that if she wasn't there as, as an option, things might have looked very different after Super Tuesday. 
And then the rest is all very recent history. So we know what happened after that. And here we are in May of 2020. Coronavirus pandemic. We're all locked in our houses. And somewhere in the background is Joe Biden hiding in his basement as the potential 46th president of the United States of America. And the primaries are still going on. Technically, he hasn't won, he hasn't won enough delegates at this point to clinch the nomination. But really, there's very little to make me think that Biden isn't going to be on the ticket in November. It is still possible that it could be someone else. But one of his biggest weaknesses right now is the allegations of Tara Reid, that Joe Biden sexually assaulted her back in 1993. And whether or not you believe Tara Reid, it's striking to see the difference between the way that the media talks about the Tara Reid allegations and the allegations against Brett Kavanaugh by Christine Blasey Ford. With Christine Blasey Ford, that was sort of the height of, of the Me Too era. And actually, while I do believe Christine Blasey Ford, there is actually there was less evidence corroborating her allegations than there is for Tara Reid. For Christine Blasey Ford, it was essentially her word against his. With Tara Reid and Joe Biden, Tara Reid now has multiple sources to confirm her allegations, or at least that something happened. She told her siblings, she told a neighbor at the time who has since come out, she told a former co-worker, she told her mother and mentioned that her mother, who was very upset about it, called into the Larry King live show and mentioned that something had happened to her daughter while working for a prominent senator. And that footage has since been found, and, it was, and it's confirmed to be the voice of Tara Reid's mother talking to Larry King about this. So there's more to corroborate Tara Reid's story than there ever was to corroborate Christine Blasey Ford's story. Also, what happened to Tara Reid happened while Joe Biden was a sitting senator. And what happened to Christine Blasey Ford, while unacceptable, happened when the two of them were high school students at a party. So the allegations against Joe Biden were arguably worse because it was a man with much more power sexually assaulting one of his female employees. And the media seems completely unwilling to touch the story. The, M the Intercept actually did a piece on it by Ryan Grimm, and a lot of other sources such as MSNBC and CNN seem to doubt Ryan Grimm's credibility because he is a vocal he was a vocal supporter of Bernie Sanders so they think he's biased however he broke the original story about Christine Blasey Ford and at the time they all found him to be very credible but now that he's attacking their candidate with a D next to his name as opposed to Brett Kavanaugh with an R next to his name somehow it's completely different with Brett Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford Back then, and it wasn't that long ago, there was this idea that, that women have the right to be believed and that victims have the right to be believed. And now, what you keep hearing is that with Tara Reid, women have the right to be listened to, but you don't really have to believe them. Or even if you do believe them, it doesn't really matter what happened. And this is because a lot of these people high up in the party and high up in the media are hypocrites. And they don't really care about Christine Blasey Ford, or they don't really care about Tara Reid. What they cared about was making sure that, by any means necessary, Brett Kavanaugh did not become a Supreme Court justice. And now they care that, by any means necessary, Joe Biden or somebody else beats Donald Trump. You have people like actress Melissa Milano, who is a strong activist for the Me Too movement, who endorsed Joe Biden, and then in light of Tara Reid accusations, has been making has made up all sorts of ways to defend him, saying things like, even though even though Tara Reid deserves to be heard, that people shouldn't be politicizing it, even though she had no problem politicizing the assault of Christine Blasey Ford. And in light of new evidence corroborating Tara Reid, she said something like the Me, Too er the Me Too movement doesn't mean that we should believe women no matter what. It believes that we should change the culture of not believing women. And no one is saying here that you should believe Tara Reid no matter what. But she has a very compelling story and plenty of evidence to prove that this actually happened. And yet 
people in the media do not want to talk about it at all, simply because they're afraid that it'll affect Joe Biden. And if we bring it up, Trump will use it against him. But you know what? Trump's going to use it no matter what. So we, we might as well talk about it now and figure out whether or not it actually happened, have him actually confront the issue on his own. At the moment, no one has actually asked him, no major outlet has asked Joe Biden about the allegations. I think one small local reporter from somewhere in the South did have a brief, brief interview with Joe Biden, and he asked him a question about the allegations, asking him whether or not it might hurt his chances against Trump. But so far, that's the only question he's had to field. And just ignoring it isn't going to make the problem go away. What needs to happen is there should be an open discourse about the allegations. Joe Biden needs to answer for it in his own words. And if anything did happen, he needs to have an he, he needs to have a sincere apology, at least some way of making up for it. I don't know exactly what he could do. And if he can't do that and people in the Democratic Party decide that it's too much of liability, they need to drop Joe Biden before it's too late. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to be Bernie Sanders. It could be anyone else. Because really what, what the strategy seems to be is it's a referendum against Donald Trump. So it doesn't really matter who it is running against Trump if your message is purely an anti-Trump message. It could be any middle-of-the-road Democrat. They're never going to pick Bernie Sanders because these people in charge of the party hate Bernie Sanders. So you know what? Just pick someone else. Pick Amy Klobuchar. Pick... You know, you're the new media darling, Andrew Cuomo. Pick somebody other than Joe Biden who has less baggage. It could be anyone at this point. And ultimately, the party still has the ability to pick whoever they want. They're afraid to do it because then it shatters this illusion they have of holding democratic primaries. But so what? If you really want to win at this point, dump Joe Biden and pick anybody else. And, be, and don't pretend... Like you're holding the moral high ground in this situation. Not with a candidate like Joe Biden. Everyone, they seem to be forgetting that he's just that he's the presumptive nominee at this point. There are still plenty of delegates to be doled out. There's still plenty of primaries to be held, even if they're being held through the mail at this point. But Joe Biden is only the presumptive nominee. He is not the actual nominee for 2020. And that being said, as awful as he is... In my opinion, I know some people love him, but if you if you objectively look at everything about Joe Biden, you may decide that he's better than Trump, but he you can't call him a strong candidate. But we're in this unique situation with somebody as polarizing as Trump at the helm and something this black swan moment like a worldwide pandemic where maybe Joe Biden could win. And it's interesting to think about it's going to it's going to come down to turnout and the actual size of the electorate. For instance, if it had come down to Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump with no pandemic, that would have led to maybe one of the, the largest elections in in year in decades with the largest number of people voting. Because all of the middle of the road centrist democrats would have voted for anybody but Trump, so they would have turned out and then all of the new people brought into the party by the Sanders campaign would have turned out as well. And then on the other side, you'd have the entire Republican Party, from his supporters to his half-hearted supporters, all lined up behind Trump because they're good at falling in line when they know they need the numbers. However, what we have is Joe Biden, who's only popular amongst a very small sliver of the Democratic Party, versus Donald Trump, who is beginning to piss off even his own base. And what I think you're going to see in November, partly because of the pandemic and partly because of the unpopularity of these two men, is that a lot of people aren't going to vote. And a lot of people who do vote are either going to leave the top blank or they're going to vote third party. So I think the decision is, is going to be made by a very small number of people who actually feel it's worth their time and effort to go out and vote and pick between these two men. And if enough Trump voters decide that they don't feel like voting, or maybe it's raining and cold that day, or they can't get off for any number of reasons that might stop them from voting, if they decide that day, I don't care enough to go to the polls, 
we might see a Joe Biden win. It's all in Trump's hands now. It really depends on what he's able to do between now and the election. If he can send out more checks to average Americans, if he can prop up small businesses, if he can do what needs to be done, if he can show that he can do it, then he has a good chance of winning. But if he just botches it, then there's no way he's going to win. He's going to be Herbert Hoover in the 1930s, trying to impose austerity during, a, during the Great Depression. And Joe Biden's no FDR, but in that circumstance, he'd have a real chance of winning. And something people need to consider is the fact that how old Joe Biden is. So he's already said he's going to pick a female vice president. And whoever he picks is probably going to be much younger than him. So whoever he picks is presumably going to be the 2024 frontrunner for the nomination. So whoever becomes his vice president has a chance at 12 years in the White House. Four years as his vice president, or less maybe, and then up to eight years as the president, making Joe Biden kind of a placeholder in the Oval Office. So whoever he picks as vice president is very important. That will tell us a lot about the future direction of the Democratic Party. But it's also, th it's also interesting to think about if Trump loses and we end up with Joe Biden, then there's a chance at two back-to-back -back one term presidents, which is something that has only happened once before, which is just before the American Civil War, just before Abraham Lincoln, we had two one term presidents back to back. We had Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan, both of whom were very unpopular presidents. And this whole period of Pierce, Buchanan, and Lincoln correlated with a drastic shift in um in the political landscape at the time. It marked sort of the end of the Whig Party and the creation of the new Republican Party. Which is interesting because today, there's a real chance for a similar realignment to happen. That one of these two parties could collapse and that we might see an entirely new party. The question is, which one is it going to be? And that, that's going to be answered by the results of the 2020 election. Whether it's the, if the Democrats win, the, the Republican Party is going to fall apart. And if the Republican Party, if Trump wins re-election, the Democratic Party is going to fall apart. Maybe not right away, but there's a very realistic chance of that happening. And you could see it happening for the last four years at this point. Because in both parties, you have the populist elements and the more corporatist elements of those parties at war with one another. In the Democratic Party, you have sort of the progressive left wing of the party against centrist, corporate-friendly Democrats. And a lot of these people who are in charge, these centrist Democrats like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and, and Joe Crowley, who, who lost to AOC, Joe Biden, a lot of these people in the DNC came into power in the 80s during the, the Reagan administration. And they entered the party during a time where progressive left-wing politics seemed to have failed and they, were, they had to adjust to a new political climate and sort of rebuild the party, which is what led to Clinton's third way. So now when there's a rise in the progressive left within the party, they're kind of afraid because they think that's a losing strategy because in their day in the 80s, that was a losing strategy. And alternatively, in the Republican Party, you see sort of the old school... Bush-Reagan conservatives were much more corporate-friendly. People like Paul Ryan and Jeff Flake and Mitch McConnell, Republican. And then you have the everyday populist Trump supporters, a lot of whom aren't in power. A lot of them are just the actual voting, voting base. And they're really challenging the I ideology of conservatism and the ideology of the Republican Party. They're breaking down a lot of these libertarian ideas that were pervasive in the party and making it a lot more heterodox. For instance, on issues like trade. Even though a lot of people refuse to admit it, across the entire country, regardless of party, there's this ever-widening division between classes, between the haves and the have-nots. And for a long time it's worked because the haves, they've pitted the people who have a little versus the people who have nothing. So they've pitted the 
the working class and the middle and the lower middle class against each other. But the problem is the middle class is shrinking. So a lot of people are falling closer to poverty. <clears throat> For the first time, the newer generations do not have a strong chance of having a better livelihood than their parents' generation before them. So whether it's the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, on both sides, the everyday people, aka populists, are posing a major challenge, a major challenge to the older leadership of both parties, which has largely been very corporation friendly on both sides. So I think what's going to happen is whichever side is able to capture that populist momentum is going to be the one that's that's going to survive. And the other party is probably going to break up, maybe into two smaller parties, or just disappear altogether and a new party will be created. So in many ways, if Biden were to win, major changes will happen because of his election, but it won't be because of any of his policy. It'll just be, it's going to be because the Democrats won and because there's this new heir presumptive in whoever his vice president is. The real change is going to come when that person takes power. The real changes are going to come from their policy agendas. You know, hypothetically, if, if he wins and Trump loses, there could be a good 12 years of Democrats in the White House, and the Republicans will have to reckon with, will have to do a lot of soul searching, sort of a magnified version of what happened in 2012, <clears throat> with what they called their autopsy in the wake of Mitt Romney's loss. Because Donald Trump's victory always relied on shrinking the electorate, because they knew that the, that the country as a whole was becoming more, more diverse. So what they had to do was make sure that the people who voted were mostly white working class and find ways to exclude younger voters, more liberal and more progressive voters, people of color, people who were less likely to vote for Trump. So this is a strategy that could only work, maybe only work once and possibly twice, but it couldn't work three times. Trump is really a short-term asset, but in the long run, he's a major risk. And once he's gone, they have to figure out who they are without Trump. So what do we do with all this information? Vote Trump? Vote third party? Skip the vote entirely? Honestly, I'm not suggesting you do anything. I don't want to tell you you're a bad person for voting for Joe Biden. But we can't shame people for deciding not to vote for Biden either. I've been seeing far too many people posting online about how Democrats need to suck it up and vote for Biden because it's unacceptable that we have Trump for another four years. But first of all, you need to ask yourself, are all of your problems really going to disappear the moment Trump leaves office? You need to realize that a lot of Democrats, quote unquote, are people who only join the party because they live in a state with closed primaries and that they had to become a Democrat if they wanted to vote for Bernie Sanders. And now that he's out of the race, those people have zero reason to stick around, especially considering that there's almost no overlap between Biden and Sanders' platforms. Yes, I realize that the Dems are putting together a task force with a few progressives on it, but 99% of the time, task forces are put together to give the illusion that people in power care about a given issue, but don't want to do anything about it. As Bernie Surrogate and State Senator Nina Turner said, we don't need a task force, we need Medicare for all. The truth of the matter is that the establishment Democrats refuse to budge one inch on their position, and they have zero incentive at this point to do so. The progressive left no longer has any leverage, since they've promised to support whoever the nominee is. The moment that Bernie Sanders said he thought Joe Biden could beat Donald Trump, he completely destroyed the argument for his own candidacy. If he had done what Donald Trump did in 2016 and threatened not to support the eventual nominee if it was someone else, he would have given himself so much more leverage. He should have said something along the lines of, I can't promise that my supporters will fall in line behind another candidate if I'm not elected. Even, even if I asked them to, there's a good chance most of them won't. Something like that. And sure, it would have pissed off a lot of people. But given the choices, I think the established, establishment Dems and moderate voters would have chosen Bernie. He was running as a political outsider, so he should have just acted like one. Instead, he couldn't stop calling Joe Biden his friend, his good friend Joe Biden. This signaled to people that Bernie was going to support Biden all along. 
And now, if Biden does win, the Dem Party leaders will say it's because of their style of corporate-friendly centrism, or as they'll probably call it, pragmatic centrism or something like that. They'll say that was what the American people wanted. And if he loses, they'll say it's because the left wing of the party sabotaged Joe Biden's chances. Whether they win or lose, it's going to be on their own terms. If they win, they don't want to have to fight for any of the progressive agendas from Bernie's platform, because it would alienate the corporate lobbyists that butter their bread. And if they lose, then so be it. For them, their own lives won't be tangibly any worse under four more years of Trump. About 50% of Congress are millionaires. The average U.S. member of Congress is 12 times wealthier than the average American citizen. And I'm not saying they don't deserve a decent wage, although many of them definitely don't deserve it and definitely don't need it. But having that much money shelters them from the worst effects of Trump. And if anything, his 2017 tax bill makes them slightly wealthier. So it's no skin off their bones if he's reelected. Also, it's so much easier to be in opposition than it is to be in power. Just look at the Republican Party under Obama. They didn't have to stand for anything. They didn't have to stand for anything at all other than being anti-Obama. They could write these incredibly conservative bills knowing they wouldn't be passed, so there was, and there was no reason to water them down, and then they could turn to their constituencies after the Democrats voted that bill down and say, look, those evil Democrats voted down our bill, and they refused to compromise with us. And now the Democrats get to do it too, only they aren't nearly as cunning as Mitch McConnell, who elevated minority opposition to an art form. I mean, the man may be an absolute villainous swamp creature with the face of an aging snapping turtle, but he's one of the best politicians at pulling the levers of power, something that Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer just will never be as good at as he is. And these people in both parties want to put the blame on us, the voters, if we don't turn out and if we don't vote for the correct candidate. It's the same way that we've all been shamed into using paper straws. <clears throat> Meanwhile, massive corporations are dumping millions of tons of CO2 and methane into our atmosphere with zero regard for human life. Those at the top love to shift the blame to those at the bottom because they refuse to be held responsible for their actions. If Joe Biden or Donald Trump or anyone else really want my vote, they need to offer me, the voter, something. They need to give me a damn good reason to show up to the polls on a cold November day and suspend my suspicions that my vote doesn't really matter. If the only thing they have to offer is that the other guy will be even worse, then that only incentivizes me to tune out of politics altogether. As Kyle Kalinske of Secular Talk put it recently, if you walk up to me and say, I'm going to break either your pinky finger or your nose, pick. I'm going to say neither and tell you to piss off. What the Democratic Party have effectively said by not offering an olive branch to the progressive left is that they don't want them and they don't need them. So I'm saying, fine, good luck. If you want to win with Joe Biden on the ticket, sure, maybe it's possible, but you're going to have to do it without us. Thanks, everyone, for listening to my first episode. I just want to say, if you've made it to the end of this podcast, that I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to me. The more the people that listen to this, it'll just encourage me to put out continuous content and put out, hopefully, better content. It's a lot of work to do all the research for one episode, and I could easily see myself getting lazy and giving this up if I didn't have people like you who actually took the time to listen to this. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for listening. As I said before, if you have any suggestions for me, you can reach me on Twitter at AmericanMadAF or on Patreon.com at Patreon forward slash American Madness. I know sometimes it's a pain in the ass knowing information. You learn The more you learn, sometimes the more miserable you are, at least when it comes to politics. We'd all be happier if we could just ignore everything that was going on, but we'd also be in far more danger. 
I don't know about you, but I'd rather have a knife going into a gunfight than just my bare fists. So just knowing is half the battle, but it's better than nothing at all. Thank you all, and take care.